and welcome to our fifth Wide Angle Lunch in this first series of six talks. I'm going to say some thank yous at the end of today's talk. Um, in the past, the past few weeks, we've had visitors from as far afield as Berlin in Germany, and the UK, and our neighbouring city, Colombia. And it's been really interesting to see the number of attendees just growing steadily and then kind of exploding over the last couple of weeks. Um, last week we heard about the relationship between Turkey and America, Turkey being America's best ally in the Middle East. <laughs> um, but I'm delighted that for our final two talks in the series, we are hearing from some real gems in our own community. Uh, next week, Kia Gordon, who is a young assistant professor at the College of Charleston, will speak to us about democracy in South Africa. And today, we have um, Tom Tisdale, who's going to speak to us about Anthony Tuma Porter, whose memoir led on. Tom's new publishing venture, Home House, has just reissued. And um, this is available for sale today, and a portion of the proceeds is going to the Library Society. And so um, we will point you in that direction at the end of the talk, in case you don't already have a copy. Before I introduce Tom properly, um, I'll just say that, unlike me, a, a newcomer in Charleston, many of you will no doubt feel that you know so much about the Civil War and the Reconstruction period and Charleston's role in that time. And what, what extra could you possibly learn from someone like Anthony Tuma Porter. I would say, having read the book, that if our society had really internalized and absorbed everything that Tuma Porter believed in and lived for, about the importance of, the crucial importance of education for everyone in our society, the importance of reconciliation in all sorts of fields, an enormous self-sacrifice for the greater good, if, if we really internalized all of this, then our society would be even more united and more prosperous than it is today. The other thing I found when I read the book is that um, it still holds a lot of lessons and inspiration for people who are looking to launch a new charitable venture or to sustain a charitable venture through tough times. And we're in tough times now, and Anthony Tuma Porter certainly was following the Civil War. And now to Tom. Many of you here will already know him and be aware of his encyclopedic knowledge of Southern history, but I would like to set out a few more of his accomplishments. Tom read history at, I think it was history, at the University of the South in Suwannee, and then law at the University of South Carolina. And he's been practicing as an attorney here since 1964. Right. Um, he, including being president of the South Carolina Bar in the early, early 1980s. And he's currently a member of Next and Pruitt, just up the street from here, where he continues to take on some of the most cutting edge cases. And as a, an ex lawyer, a recovering lawyer myself, I'm very jealous about some of the <laughs> fascinating um, pieces of litigation and other cases that Tom is involved in. <coughs> Tom is also a tireless contributor to this community. To name just a few of a very wide range of items, he served as president of the South Carolina Historical Society until earlier this year. He's on the board of trustees of the Southern Education Foundation. He has served on the board of the Aquarium, the Spoleto Festival USA, the Executive Council of the Episcopal Church. He was chair of the board of trustees of Porter Guard School and chancellor of the Diocese of South Carolina for 15 years. There are many more things I could mention, but I chose these because I think they really reflect the kind of legacy that someone like Anthony Tuma Porter left and the importance of education, faith, and um, a great deal of hard work for the community. Tom also served in the US Naval Reserve for seven years and before that in the Army's National Guard. He's the author of a really fascinating um, life of his an ancestor, Natalie <coughs> DeLage Sumter, who was a goddaughter of Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI, who, to cut a long story short, fell in love with a certain Thomas Sumter Jr., son of the famous Revolutionary War hero, the Gamecock, um, fell in love with him on a ship and then came to live in Stateburg, South Carolina. So Tom is also a published historian and he's written and produced plays. His latest venture is the launch of um, Home House Press, which will print books, well, it will reprint some older books and it will launch new publications that are particularly relevant to life here in the Low Country. When Felix and I moved to Charleston, Tom gave us a copy of Led On, 
and told us to read it as a first step in our education as true Southerners. Knowing Tom better now and having heard all his accomplishments, I think it's clear that the second step of our education as true Southerners is to hear him give his angle on the period. And so I'm really delighted that he has come here today to the Library Society to speak to us. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, he said that uh, 
the Shakespeare papers were out of print, the founding documents of the colony. And uh, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> I said, well, I don't know, but I'll look into it. Well, he said, well, let me know, because we need them pretty quick. <laughs> so then, uh, I'm on in the same time frame, January or maybe a little before, I was contacted by a priest at Grace Church, Candy Perkins, who's head of that. And uh, she said, in a persuasive way, in which priests can often only be, Tom, uh, uh, this book, Dr. Porter's book, needs to be revived, and you need to do something about it. What are you going to do? I said, I don't know, but I'll look into it. <laughs> so I looked into both of those issues, and uh, and was frankly exasperated about what to do. So then I called my good friend, longtime friend, writer and editor, Steve Hoffius, who's here, and said, Steve, here's the situation. And I explained it. And Steve, in his always pleasant, non panicky disposition, said, well, let's just go ahead and publish the book. So that's what we did, Home House Press, has published these two books, and it will publish other books that are important to the history of South Carolina, new books and old books. So there are several projects underway that you will be hearing about as we go forward. Now, uh, why did we need a, a new uh, edition of Dr. Porter's book? The first edition was published, by the way, as an autobiography he wrote. It is the most wonderful treasure of the story of events, not only in his life, but in our lives during the period of Civil War and Reconstruction and afterward. The first, five, the first edition that he wrote was in 1898 and by G.P. Putnam's and Sons, and this is the first edition. There have been two or three editions since that before I was. This is one of them, and by the way, this book, Putnam's book, Dr. Porter's first edition, didn't have an index or an introduction. Neither did any of the other editions since then until ours was published this year. And by the way, uh, when Steve and I finally decided to do this in January, we already had the books off the press before June 1st. So we had to move fast to satisfy the request of coming in. This is just for, by example, a, an edition that came out in 1969, and it's so deficient, not only does it not have an index on introduction, but I just noticed as we were working on our edition that it all of a sudden goes from page 44 to 107 <laughs> without, much of an, without any explanation. So, that has not been much good for, for us now. Why is it that we need to know about Dr. Porter now? Why is it that we ought to restore the memory of his life, his actions, and his motives in what he did? First of all, not many people know what he did. Not many people know who he is. And we live in a very fractured society now. And his life, represents a positive action in time of a fractured society. He lived probably in the most tumultuous, I would not even say probably, he lived in the most tumultuous period of our history, certainly in the South. And he approached life positively and certainly, and his life was based on spiritual assurance, as we will see as I repeat and try to explain some of the motivations that took him forward. The first of many incidents in his life that indicate evidence of a spiritual assurance is when he was 10 years old, up in Georgetown, his father died when he was an infant, John Porter. His mother's name was Esther Tuma Porter. And, uh, his father died at a very young age in his 30s when uh, Tuma, as he was called, a uh, doctor Porter, was an infant. And uh, on his own, at age 10 years old, he went to his grave. 
at Prince George's Church. And his prayer was that he could live a life of service. And uh, from that day forward, that was the step he took uh, by spiritual guidance to live a life of service to whatever the community was. <clears throat> so uh, his early life, in his early life, he was educated in the schools of Georgetown. And he uh, then, at upper teenagers, <coughs> as an upper teenager, went to Mount Zion Academy. That was a school said to be of higher learning that uh, was in existence as a school until 1991. Mount Zion Academy is in Winsboro, up near Columbia. And uh, <coughs> he studied there for a year and a half. Uh, William Pichetti Bowes, who also figures in his story later, uh, said by many to be the greatest theologian uh, produced by the Anglican Church in America, grew up in Abbeville, also went to Mount Zion Academy before coming here to the city, and then to seminary. He was professor of uh, theology at Sewanee the University of South for many years. And his work at Sewanee becomes intertwined with Dr. Porter later. But uh, that, uh, when he finished the year and a half at Mount Zion, Dr. Porter came to Charles and went to work for a uh, firm, firm of merchants called Robinson and Blacklock on East Bay Street. And it was there, he was there for about two years. And it was during that time that his first uh, evidence of his feeling about the institution of slavery exhibited itself. Because what happened, uh, he was asked to handle a business side of a transaction that involves the sale of slaves. And he did what he was told to do by the people he was working for. But when it was over, he said to one of his employers, Robinson and Blacklock, that it was the most disagreeable thing he had ever been asked to do. And that if he was asked to participate in another such transaction, that he would leave the country. And that is the first glimpse of his social attitudes. So he did leave the company uh, not long after that, but other reasons. Went back to Georgetown <coughs> to run the rice plantation. And after a period of time, this was not happy. Was driving, riding through the woods on horseback one day and just decided then and there that he was getting some guidance from somebody other than himself or his family. And he felt the need of a call and he felt a need to change his life. Not that there was anything wrong with his life up to then, but an urge was developed. So uh, shortly thereafter, a few days later, he was saying his evening prayers, and just all of a sudden, he describes it as uh, something overcame him, and he said, if, Lord, if you wish me, here I am. And uh, that night he woke up his mother at 4.30 in the morning and said, I am, I have been called to be a priest. So he began to study for the priesthood under a man, a priest at All Saints Paul's Island named Alexander Glenn an English person, an English priest. And he became a priest, ordained uh, to the diaconate and then the priesthood began in 1854. But before that, while he was studying uh, under Father Delaney, he uh, met his wife Susan Magdalene uh, Atkins. Susan Magdalene Atkins. And they were married. Uh, 
December 16, 1852. <clears throat> During the time that he was studying for the priesthood, the bishop of the diocese, Bishop Davis, Thomas F. Davis, asked him to start working with a small group of people at what was called the Old Lawson, a small congregation of eight people. So he did that, continuing his studies at the time. And uh, the Old Lawson was at the corner, uh, southwest corner of Ashley Avenue and B Street. The building on the corner is the chapel there, called St. Luke's now, but in later days it was St. Timothy's Chapel when it became a part of his school. Uh, the old Austin is where the small congregation of eight people met. And he struggled with that uh, while studying for the priesthood. Now, uh, he, the Civil War, uh, of course, began in earnest when secession took place in 1860. And he uh, became a member of the Washington Light Infantry, still in existence here. Maybe some people in here that belong to that year. 118th Infantry. That's a <clears throat> unit, a military unit that has been involved, has been involved in many engagements of the United States and the Confederate States. Uh, in history. But he was chaplain of that organization for 37 years. And he uh, was not enthusiastic about secession, but he was a person who decided that this is what has been decided to be done by people who have the authority to decide it, and so I'm going to go along with it. And he did. And like most people, and the Confederate States Army spent time in Virginia during the war. Now, uh, before we talk about his uh, educational endeavors, which are so important to this community, I want to talk a little bit about the Civil War and, and a couple of incident, incidents that occurred in that connection in his life. And you, we will see during the course of this talk, I hope, that he was involved in some pretty remarkable events involving the Civil War and Reconstruction. And his accomplishments <coughs> were grand. So, uh, in 1865, early 1865, things were very dicey here in the Low Country. It was felt that Sherman was on the way to Charleston, General Sherman, with his army. And Dr. Porter decided to take his family to Columbia. Excuse me, he was headed for Anderson, South Carolina, with the family, wife and children. But could get no farther than Columbia because of the disruption of the war. And they found a house that they could use in Columbia. So they were there when Sherman's army arrived. Mm -hmm. And this was one of the remarkable incidents in uh, Dr. Porter's life. Uh, the town was burning. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing that happened is he encountered General Sherman on the street during the Holocaust and uh, basically chewed him out and said, uh, you know, what you're doing is very, uh, what General Sherman said, General Sherman said, this is a terrible situation that is happening now. And Dr. Porter responded, it certainly is because women and children are involved. And uh, there's an interesting historical point there. And there has been really, I haven't heard any definitive explanation as to what happened about the burning of Columbia. General Sherman said they didn't burn Columbia, they didn't intend to burn Columbia. And he said it was the governor of McGraw's fault, the governor that, that Columbia was burned, because 
the governor should have taken all the whiskey out of the dispensary and gotten it out of town before the army arrived. But what happened, and it seems to be the truth, the army got hold of the whiskey, went on this drunken rage, and started ravaging everything in town, including burning down the houses. And uh, General Sherman, another thing we can't understand about him is why he didn't come to Johnson. We thought he was. Why he didn't, we don't know. Never has been explained, at least I haven't heard it. He diverted 12 miles from there and headed to Columbia, and the town was demolished. Now, uh, <clears throat> here is something that happened in Columbia that was at least providential. There was a man named Lieutenant John McQueen, who was a Northern officer, Illinois. And for reasons unknown by anybody, he decided that it was his obligation to protect the Porter family in the house. He prevented the house from being burned down by the Northern Army. A fire, at one point the house caught on fire, and Lieutenant McQueen saw that the fire was put out. He saved the Porter family. <coughs> and uh, that uh, led to a lifelong relationship between Dr. Porter and Lieutenant McQueen. Uh, Lieutenant McQueen stayed in Columbia. Every house within eight blocks of the Porter house was burned down. But the Porter house was not. So it begs the question of why wasn't it? And what motivated Lieutenant McQueen? Why this house? So this lifelong uh, friendship developed. Before Lieutenant McQueen stayed behind. And then, by pure chance, Dr. Porter found him in a hospital nearby Columbia <coughs> and gave him a letter of safe passage so he could get back and join Sherman's Army, which by then was in North Carolina. <coughs> so he gave him a letter of safe passage and saved Lieutenant Queen's life. Now that plays another part of stepping stone to something that happened later. But I will say this while it's on my mind, <coughs> so I don't forget that we will come to the point that Dr. Porter founded the Church of the Holy Communion, which is a corner of Ashley Avenue and County Streets right now, a very vibrant congregation. And uh, uh, the cross on the hill at the Church of the Holy Communion was given to the parish by Lieutenant McQueen. Amazing. So, uh, <clears throat> McQueen got back to his unit. The Porter family in finally ended up getting back to Charleston. And Dr. Porter uh, began his work to educate the community and save civilization by providing an education for every person. Now, one tragic thing happened at, early in the war, and that is Dr. Porter and his wife, uh, Susan Macklin Porter's 10-year-old son, John Porter, died. And uh, the last words of uh, the last words of the son lying on his deathbed here in Charleston were, O Lord, save thy people and bless thine heritage. Uh, that appears in Psalm 28 and also in the Te Deum in the Book of Common Prayer. That's what this 10 year old boy said as his last words. So when the war ended, you can imagine what it was like around there. I mean, you can just imagine what life is like. 
and he needed to figure out what to do. He knew that education was important. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but he went to his son's grave, which was at Magnolia Cemetery, uh, John Porter's grave. Uh, the body was later moved to Georgetown, where the Porter family, including Dr. Porter and others, are buried. But he went to the Magnolia Cemetery and he spent four hours at the grave. Now, Dr. Porter says that during that visit, he heard his son utter the same words that I just read. He was so moved and taken by what he understood he was now to do as a result of that visit, that he ran halfway home to the Cornell Spring and Rutledge Avenue, where his house was. <clears throat> and he said that what he had been told to do was to start a school for every child. And he did. He started a school where he educated 1,800 African-American children, the children of former slaves. He started what was called the Holy Communion Church Institute for white children and educated many people who later made, have made great contributions to this uh, community and this world. But uh, <coughs> in order to do that, it required money. And so we enter into another important phase of his work. Bishop Davis was blind and destitute, living in Tampa. Bishop Davis told him, I want you to go up north and I want you to raise money. I want you to go wherever you need to do to raise money for these schools that you need to stop and to educate these children. I want you to go raise money for what the church can do in South Carolina. And he did. He went to uh, Washington, Baltimore, uh, New York, and Boston. And he preached at his church. This person had a day who was wrecked at one of those churches in uh, New York where Dr. Porter preached. And on one occasion, the people got very restless when the rector of the family said, well, we're gonna hear from this man from down in Charleston, South Carolina. And Several of them got up wanted to leave, and the rector closed the doors and told them they weren't leaving. They were going to stay there and listen. And they did. And of course, as you might expect, they were mesmerized. And the money came flowing in. He went to England and raised money. And uh, one of the quotations that I enjoyed from the book, by the way, uh, on the point of quotations. You remember I told you about when he went to his father's grave when he was 10 years old on his own, he later wrote of that experience, one sentence. He said, the spiritual world is much nearer to us than we can possibly conceive. That was one of the basis for his whole life. Then, uh, on another uh, aspect of, of his work. When he went to England to raise money, he described one visit this way. S London. Several dinner parties were given to me, <coughs> and thus more friends were made. More, more, uh, more friends were made for my work. The Archbishop of Canterbury, <coughs> Dr. Tate. The Archbishop of Devon, of Devon, the celebrated Dr. Trench. The Primate of Scotland, Lord Connors. Then Lord High Chancellor of England. Lord and Lady Shelman, and the Earl and the Countess of Aberdeen. All extended to me social hospitality and some of them generous contributions. And so, he apparently had a very pleasant trip to England and raised a lot of money at the same time. And uh, brought the money back here, took what he needed from the schools, and uh, 
David the rest of Bishop Davis for the work of the diocese. Now, um, the Church of the Holy Communion started <coughs> by him, and he was rector there for over 40 years. His son, second one after the one who died, was named Theodore Atkinson Porter, and he uh, was also a priest and worked with his father at the Church of Holy Communion. And uh, uh, Dr. Porter's life uh, through his son, Tom Theodore Atkinson Porter, has also had great influence in our time. A lot of Dr. Porter's descendants are sitting right in this room today. And uh, one of my father's closest <coughs> friends, who was also a priest, closest friends in his life was Theodore Atkinson Porter. Their great grandson of uh, Dr. Porter, I think. Theodore Atkinson, Theodore Porter Ball, was is who I'm speaking of. Theodore Porter Ball, the name for his grandfather, great grandfather, Theodore Atkinson Porter. And one of the things I'd like to do when Steve and I do the next reprint of this book is to include a basic genealogy of the Porter family because it's hard to get it out of this book. He did not say much about his family. And to find out the name of even his wife, <coughs> takes a lot of digging in the book. And Steve, we're gonna to try to do that in the, in the next week around. And we also found out today that Ralph Noble, who's sitting right behind you, has a list of every student who attended the Holy Communion Church Institute through Port Dad. So we can also put that in the next book. Now, <clears throat> how did Dr. Porter raise the money? Uh, he went to Washington on one occasion, on more than one occasion, but there was a man here in uh, Charleston named George Alfred Trunham, and I see one of Mr. Trunham's descendants sitting here today, listening. <coughs> Now, Mr. Truman was the Secretary of the Treasury of the Confederate States of America. So he didn't have much standing when the law was over around that. <coughs> In fact, he couldn't do anything. He was stripped of the citizenship, couldn't conduct any business, and he was Dr. Porter's main supporter. And Dr. Porter knew that. So Dr. Porter goes to Washington, goes to Washington walks into the White House and says, uh, come to see the press, Andrew Johnson at the time. And President Johnson said, I'd like to see that man. So he walks in one afternoon, explains the situation about Mr. Trunham's, George Alfred Trunham's inability to help him down here in Charleston with all these problems, and explained himself. And President Johnson said, come back in the morning, the pardon will be ready. And he did, and he got the pardon from Mr. Trump. got the pardon from Mr. Trump. Mr. Trump was restored to citizenship and went back to help the Dr. Porter, the right hand Charles. <coughs> At the same time, close to the same time, but not on the same visit, Dr. Porter said he needed the Marine Hospital over here that was owned by the government to educate African-American children. And uh, President Johnson helped him with that. And he was given the Marine Hospital for the purpose of educating African-American children in Charleston. President Johnson gave him a personal check for $1,000 to help with it. And you can imagine what $1,000 would be worth today. In today's currency, it was a big gift. And that school was the beginning of the Jenkins Orphanage. It morphed in history into the Jenkins Orphanage. That, we know, has contributed so much to our community up to the mountain. That was a big point in uh, the legacy of uh, Dr. Porter's ministry, was to educate all children, black and white, 
beginning at Marine Institute. The Holy Communion Church Institute uh, was begun in 1867. In 1886, the name of it was changed to Porta Academy. It was later named Porta Military Academy when it undertook that particular, you know, military. It was in vogue to have military school. And if people had a day or two to that school, including Father Pop. And uh, <coughs> that school was located at what we call the Old Austin. And that is still right there at the Medical University. If you're driving up Ashley Avenue, right before you come to B Street, on the corner of St. Luke's Chapel, West St. Timothy's, when Port Academy was there. South inside from there was the school. <coughs> it was the old arsenal. That arsenal was the first successful uh, takeover by the Confederate forces of federal property in America. I mean, in the war, in America, of course, but in the war, in the Civil War, it was federal property. But of course, by the end of the war, it reverted back to federal ownership. And Dr. Porter decided he needed that property to, uh, to house the school. Uh, so how did he get? He uh, went up to the White House, <laughs> and President Hayes was president then. <laughs> and uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, and uh, 1879. And he uh, had a conversation with Mrs. Hayes and with President Hayes. And Mrs. Hayes was in full support of the project. And, but in addition to all of that, it was thought that he needed some outside help to persuade the government to give him this property. And so what does he do? He gets in touch with General Sherman <laughs> and says, look, uh, I needed this also for my school in Charleston. Would you be kind enough to help me persuade the government to do that? <clears throat> General Sherman wrote a letter to the president and said, my friend, my friend, Dr. Porter down in Charleston needs this property. The government does not need it. But I would like you to give it to him for many reasons, but for one reason, he saved the life of one of my officers, Lieutenant McQueen. So that is how um, the school was obtained. Of course, they gave him the school. They first put it, the hospital, they first put it in the form of a lease without any rent, do you? but then ended up just simply giving it to him. Now, uh, he saved civilization, how? Huh? He saw that a spiritual presence and assurance was necessary for his whole life. And he saw that we could not return to any condition of civility without education. And he spent his whole life uh, in that on that track and in that mode. The only parish that he uh, served besides the Church of the Holy Communion uh, was St. Mark's, which was founded in 1867 for our former slaves. And uh, <clears throat> Bishop Howe of the diocese then, W.D.W. W. Howe, came to him in the late 1870s and said, uh, Tuma, uh, I want you to go over, in addition to handling the Church of Holy Communion, take care of St. Mark's on Thomas Street. And he said, uh, he said, well, if this is W.B.W. Howe speaking to me, my answer will be no. But if this is Bishop W.B.W. Howe speaking to me, I will say yes. And of 
Coast Condition said, uh, most assuredly, uh, this is this past And he went over there and was the priest there in our St. Mark's parents for quite a few years. Now, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Porter is not remembered now, generally, in the community or in the world. And uh, it is the belief of some, and I hope some of you will be candid in the group, <coughs> that think that it is the time to revive his qualities, his character, his motivation, and his uh, spirit to try to solve some of the fractured aspects of the society that we're living in now. Some of the issues are the same. Uh, his is a remarkable story, and uh, as Caroline said early in these remarks, uh, in her introduction, that we have a few copies of the book here, and any of you who would like a copy, uh, we will be arranging for that right after this talk. Now, we are obliged to have everybody out of here just a few minutes, but I would be happy to take any questions or uh, receive any comments. Uh, let me say one other thing before I come to the end, because this is interesting. And I told Father Park I was going to tell the story, if, if I didn't forget, I almost did. When, when uh, Dr. Porter went to Washington uh, and got the pardon from Mr. Trump, Mr. George Alfred Trump, it was a matter of 24 hours and he had the pardon. Mr. Trump was back in business, fortunately. But Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, asked the Roman Catholic Bishop of Charleston, Patrick Neeson Lynch, to go to Rome to try to talk the Pope into recognizing the Confederate States of America as a legitimate government. Bishop Lynch who, by the way, was a South Carolinian, born and grew up in Chiraw. And I think might be the only bishop of the diocese from South Carolina. But in any case, uh, I presume some of the motivation of Bishop Lynch to go ahead and say, yes, I'll go, was I suppose Rome was a little easier place to live in <laughs> at that time than hell. <laughs> so he went to Rome. He went to Rome. And of course, it didn't take long for the Pope to say no. But the problem was this. You see seeing as kind of a walk from a strip of citizenship. Couldn't come home. Had no passport, nothing. And was in Rome. I suppose that he didn't think that was too bad of an arrangement either until things settled down and had a little more. By the way, he's buried right over here in the crypt of the cathedral. A slave owner had 12 slaves. Yeah. before the war. And uh, it took a year and a half for that thing to get straightened out. Had to take an act of Congress to get Bishop Lynch back home. But he did come home, was gone about two years in Rome, <laughs> and uh, came back without any recognition after the war was over and continued his ministry. Now, that, uh, I think, demonstrates the uh, ability of uh, Dr. Porter to get things done. Many people in this community went to his school, Fuller Community Church Institute, some very important people. One of the former bishops of our diocese, William Alexander Gary, which is an entirely different story, but he went to the school, and anybody who promised it thought they were headed towards the ministry, Dr. Porter sent this morning, go to college, and then to study under William Pacheco Bowles, the great theologian, uh, and come back to South Carolina. And many did that. <coughs> so uh, I uh, thank you for listening to these remarks about this remarkable man, and I hope something I've said will whet your appetite to learn more about it, and I hope that the publication of this book which has a beautiful index. My colleague, Steve Hoffman, is the managing editor of the press.
prepared and a less brilliant uh, introduction by me. Uh, <laughs> we'll, whet, we'll whet your appetite for instilling now the ideals of uh, Dr. Porter. Thank you. many people in the audience know about more about this thing than I do. So does anybody have a question? And if I can't answer it, we'll refer to an authority. Yes, Eric. Well, Tom, this isn't exactly a question, it's a request. There are a number of people here today that have been associated with or are associated with Porter Gallery. Yes, so the headmaster chef. And one of them is Mr. Ralph Norman, history teacher of great fame and uh, knowledge, and I wondered if he might tell us just a little bit more about the connection between the McQueen family, as you do at graduation, and Porter Gallup today. Right. Well, until recently, the McQueen family... Stand uh, up, please. <laughs> Until recently, the McQueen family remembered the school every year by making a donation to the leading history student at the school. And uh, then, as this was presented, why the story of Dr. Porter and Lieutenant McQueen and the rest was told again, so that the student body then was sort of kept up the tradition of one Thank you, thank you, Ralph. And Ralph's one of the ones I was worried about during the talk. But, <laughs> but just, just one second, Paul uh, Porter Gallup, by the way, <clears throat> was founded in 1965. The headmaster's out of date, the Bose Eggleston. And uh, this temple arranged for the merger of the Gallup School and Porter Academy at the location where it is now. Uh, on Albemarle Point, this beautiful, wonderful school. Mm -hmm. when, when the war was over, as we all know, the United States government put President Jefferson Davis in prison with chains on his legs and arms. And when the Pope learned that, he personally wove a crown of thorns and sent it to Davis at the prison. I've seen it, it's on display. Who here. sent the thorns? The Pope. The Pope. Okay. It's on, it's on Dr. Porter didn't have anything to do with that, did he? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Porter wasn't involved in that, was he? Well, maybe his initial beginning. <laughs> no, he wasn't involved. <coughs> that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Question? Yes, Cameron. I was wondering um, what your explanation would be for why people in New York, in particular, and in New York, were so generous. Because I, I love the question. Well, I don't know the answer to that, but one thing is they had money and we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and number two, Dr. Porter was a very persuasive person, a parent. Because, uh, as has been said about some one of my good friends, he can, he can sell ice to Eskimos. And uh, from what I had read, he'd go in and make these talks to these people who weren't interested in hearing him and walk out of there with bundles of money. And uh, he uh, had some quite interesting encounters with people who tried to resist his uh, request for money. I think yes, that's Mr. Bowser? I think that's an interesting point. Um, maybe at some point could be further examined because many of the, ch the people in the North who were giving so generously uh, had also lost children and families in the war. Yes. And that has been a very tough situation. I think there's a lot about Dr. Porter that lends itself to further study, and I hope that some of this that is going on now will lead to that and further research. Uh, let's just vow in the most. Uh, one of the reasons why he had connections 
with in New York, was the rector of Grace Church in New York. That's correct. Had uh, the, rec the first rector there became the bishop of South, the second bishop of South Carolina, uh, Bowen. Right. And Nathaniel then, Bowen. That's right. And then um, Thomas House Taylor, who was from Georgetown, South Carolina, and from, from joining the plantation. Right. Uh, he was the rector of the land. <coughs> Before it came, unfortunately, he had had a carriage accident and was on, uh, on a tour in uh, Europe, but he left word for that carriage to support him. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, both, I was just going to add that the school continues to benefit from some of those connections. One of them is through the Jesse Ball DuPont Foundation, which continues to support the school to stay. That's wonderful. And uh, Jesse Ball DuPont, for our student this morning, came this morning to visit. She was a great friend of uh, Bishop Julian, Frank Julian, down in Jacksonville, where she lived and where her foundation is. And they still support the school and Porter Guy. Oh, thank you, Carol. If there are no more questions, I'd like to thank Tom for definitely whetting our appetite to read more about Anthony Tumor Porter. <clears throat> thank you, Tom, for speaking here today. Exhausted by his work, he frequently got ill and needed to take breaks and travel to restore his health. And so um, he really fought against adversity. Um, but the book, excuse me, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I just feel that as a human story, this is a really, it's a fascinating well, Two things, um, where are those books if you can buy them? We don't want to get out here without that opportunity. On, they're on the table at the back. Okay. And um, a very good proportion of your. Um, of your check for one of those books will go to the Library Society. They're very, very important. They're 29 95 but I think we ran it at 30 to make that change easier in case people think. Now, now, I wasn't going to do this publicly, but I'm going to do it anyway since everybody's here having such a good time. This is a book for you that I thought would be particularly appropriate. It's brand new, just came out. When London was capital of America. <laughs> Thank you.